Good evening and welcome to the October 16th, 2017 regularly scheduled meeting of the Midland Public Schools Board of Education. At this time I ask everyone to please turn off your cell phones so that we don't have interference with our TV feed. And then if you would all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. This time I'll have Scott take roll, roll call. Of course. President Brandstad. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Treasurer Frizee. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Friedel. Here. Six out of seven presidents. All right. Patrick is at the Midland City Council meeting tonight, so he is not here. All right. Moving into item two, which is our consent agenda. 2.1 is approval of the regular meeting minutes from our September 18th board meeting. 2.2 is a list of the following persons recommended for employment for the 2017-18 school year. 2.3 are the following staff members that have announced their resignations with the effective dates noted. 2.4 is the purchase of a new wrestling mat for Dow High School. 2.5 is the purchase of an engraver. And 2.6 are legal invoices for payment. At this time, entertain a motion. I motion to approve items 2.1 through 2.6 on the consent agenda. Support. Moved by Pam, supported by Scott. At this time, is there any discussion? All right, seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the consent agenda passes. Moving into item three, which is Board of Education Matters, presentations to the board. Item 3.1 is recognition of our October shining stars. Um, I'm going to call up Kim Wood if Kim wants to come join me right now. As Kim's coming up, I'm going to read a little bit about Kim. She's our first shining star of the month. Kim began her employment with MPS in 1991 as a paraprofessional at Chippewasi. During, the MP during her MPS career, she has held several positions in the district. Paraprofessional at Dow High Media Center, lead OTP at Chippewasi Elementary, help desk office professional technology administrative assistant. In 2007, she left MPS to take another position, and then last year she returned to MPS as the administrative assistant at Seabort, Seabort Elementary School. <clears throat> Kim was nominated for her shining star by MPS colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Kim does a terrific job in the office. I don't know how she juggles so many people in task. She is always pleasant and helpful. She goes the extra mile to make sure all bases are covered. She is kind and caring to the children. She is hardworking and efficient. I appreciate all that she does. Kim is often the first face that families encounter when bringing their children to school every day. She handles every opportunity for communication with the most, and most kind and gentle approach. She embodies the first impression of feelings that we all want from our bulldogs. <laughs> Behind the first impression, Kim works efficiently and diligently to answer all questions, be sure all policies and safety standards are upheld, and does so with a positive and welcoming attitude. She pays careful attention to each student in every unique situation to be sure that we are, we are best serving every one of our 600 plus children. Truly a remarkable employee, but even more remarkable person. Ms. Wood is kind to all, dedicated to the students and staff, and always working to make Siebert better. She is part of what makes every day a great day to be a Bulldog. Congratulations, Kim. <laughs> Our second shining star is Barb Warzinski. If Barb would come up. As Barb's coming up, I'll read a little bit about Barb. Barb began her employment with Midland Public Schools in January of 1972 as a third grade teacher at Chestnut Elementary. I emphasize 1972. During her, <laughs> during her tenure at MPS, she served as a teacher consultant for the Academically Talented, a teacher consultant for Endow, Administrative Assistant for Endow, and a second grade teacher at Siebert Elementary 
for approximately 14 years until she retired in June of 2010. Barb has a bachelor's and master's of art degrees from Central Michigan University. Even though Mrs. Warzynski retired more than seven years ago, she con continues to share her love of learning and passion for education with students today. She has been a substitute teacher for MPS since she retired in 2010. During the 2016-17 school year, Barb did a long-term sub-assignment for us in Miss Rita Hofsenberger's first grade classroom at Plymouth. As you remember, we sadly lost Mrs. Hoff last year to cancer. This past June, we received Shining Star nominations for Mrs. Warzynski from MPS staff members. Among their comments, the staff members wrote, Barbara stepped into the position after the first long-term sub became ill. Barbara agreed to stay until the end of the school year to provide continuity for the students. The classroom had experienced many changes due to this tragedy, and she provided stability, warmth, and loving care to the children. She tr truly went above and beyond what was expected of her as a retired teacher, substituting for the regular teacher of this first grade classroom. She stayed through the end of the year and packed and purged the items from Rita's classroom. This was a big job. I was working late one night, and Barb was still there at around 10.30 or 11 o'clock. She is an amazing sub. She stepped up when she wasn't required to do so. I'm not sure her heart could be any bigger. At <laughs> Plymouth, we think of her as a saint. Her kindness and caring help make a difficult time for students and staff just a little bit easier. As a, as a staff, we are forever grateful. She is truly a shining star. I ask if I could say a couple words because, um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Mr. Sharrow and the board for this honor. It is indeed an honor to receive a shining star. We often hear the phrase, it takes a village, and that certainly was my experience at Plymouth. From the day I began working with Mrs. Hopp's children, teachers from all grade levels and every special stopped in with words of welcome and appreciation as well as with offers of help. If I can do anything, let me know, was the common phrase. My first grade colleagues, both teachers and paraprofessionals, were ever ready with assistance. And I'd like to give a shout out to um, Kim Noe and Sherry Soapsack, who are here, just ever ready to help. And next to them, Amy Rye Fisher, who was right next door to me and would stick her head in and say, what do you need? So I appreciate that. Nicole Lloyd, an earlier shining star, our class paraprofessional, was invaluable as she worked with students and helped me learn the ropes of first grade. And Nicole is sitting back there also. <laughs> Principals Margaret Doan and Bridget Hockemeyer were always available to answer questions and give encouragement, appreciation, and assistance. Also, ever positive and ready to help were administrative assistant Joni Wing and her office paraprofessional, Jamie Dahl. And of course, the village wouldn't be complete without a shout out to my first graders who worked hard to do their best and they captured my heart along the way. Beyond the Plymouth family, I want to recognize and thank my husband and fellow ed educator, Ron, who supports my hours at school beyond the teaching day and who sends me emails that say something like, I just put a meatloaf in the oven. It'll be ready when you get home. <laughs> and Ron is sitting back there also. Ron is an adjunct instructor in communications department at Delta College. And we often share teaching stories. And we've come to the conclusion that kids are kids, no matter what age they may be. <laughs> Another shout out is to my mom, Margaret Hart. She was an elementary secretary in this district for 30 years. I have fond memories of helping her when I was young and she, in turn, has been helpful to and supportive of me throughout my teaching career. She's not here tonight, but thanks, Mom. But here is my brother, Jack, who's also sitting back there. Thanks for being here, Jack. <laughs> I began teaching in Midland Public Schools, as Mr. Charles said, in January of 1972. And I worked with Title I children in the kitchen at Mills Elementary, because that's the only place there was room. Throughout the years in the classroom, I worked in a variety of grade levels, 
as well as in the gifted education program. I was blessed to work with dedicated colleagues and children is who I would, as I would tell them, who will always be in my heart. Now as a guest teacher these past years, I continue to be blessed with caring and helpful colleagues and children to nurture and care for. I know that my time in first grade at Plymouth will stand out as a highlight in my career. Thank you again, Mr. Sharo and the board, as well as the staff, students, and families of Plymouth who welcomed me into their midst, enabled my star to shine. I look forward to continued opportunities to be a part of the Midland Public Schools family. Thank you. Moving into 3.2, more so, news from Plymouth. Yes, we have our <laughs> presentation today. It must be Plymouth night, and so <laughs> we'll hand it over to Margaret Joan, principal of Plymouth Elementary. Okay, thank you. Um, again, thank you for having it be a Plymouth night again. I do feel like I was just here in the spring. Um, and last time I was here, we were in the heavy construction zone, and I showed you pictures, but we really didn't know what it would look like. So uh, tonight, before we really get to our, our student presentation, I kind of wanted to give you our construction update. I would say we're in the construction light zone right now, which is positive. Um, we obviously <clears throat> still have a lot of work going on in the gym and cafeteria out back. Um, but for the most part, the classrooms are pretty set. Um, there's still little odds and ends that are coming up, and uh, you know we, we text our construction manager, and they're right there, and they're super helpful. So although most of our room is done, um, they haven't forgotten about us, which is fantastic. Um, so I thought that it would be really nice to just kind of go over some of the positive um, comments I've heard from students, staff, past students, and teachers. And uh, that could give you a nice uh, picture of how the construction is going. As always, my invitation is extended to come out and see Plymouth. Um, Pam stopped by. I think it was in the late summer or early school year, mm -hmm. and she had stopped by just to give some books to us, but of course I'm like, come see, come see, and I made her stay for like this 15 minute tour, and she's like, oh, I could tell by your face that you didn't really want to be there that long, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I really I love showing it off, so <laughs> come on by anytime. Anybody is welcome. Um, so a parent had said, walking into the room, wow, I love all these clean lines in the classroom. It just looks so much bigger and cleaner. Many students have said, I love our new school. Parent, do all the classrooms have those microphones? Because those are amazing. Teacher, the microphone just saves my voice by the end of the day. A parent said, I love the blue on the front of the building. It really pops and makes our school look fresh. A teacher, I love the carpet. It makes everything in the room so much quieter. Teacher from another building who was by just the other day walked in and said, wow. It actually smells really new in here, which is huge. <laughs> um, and then we always have middle school and high school students back doing different things with us. And a lot of them say, oh my gosh, this is just so different than when I went here. Um, a student said, well, I like that we're getting a new gym because the other one is so small. And then unfortunately, I had to break it to them that I think the gym will be the same size, just <laughs> new. So they weren't thrilled then. Um, and then another student said, well, it's really hard for me to say because I've always loved this school, but I do like all the changes. Um, and so those are some positive comments that we've had just about kind of the more shallow lev level aesthetics of the building. Um, again, we were probably the only school that first week that we had sweaters because the air conditioning worked so well. Uh, when Northeast, my sixth grader, came over after school and was sweating, I felt really guilty because I was like, oh, honey, I had to put on my sweater today. I can't believe it. So. Those are some great things. But really, um, some things that the bond has offered instructionally has been the one-to-one -one Chromebooks. And that's what our presentation is about tonight, um, how this has really enhanced the experience, the learning experience for students, and how they have more opportunities through the one-to-one -one devices than we've had before. So with that said, I would like to introduce our team tonight. <laughs> Mm 
We have our fourth grade team, and actually I'm going to let the kiddos introduce themselves as they present their part, um, but we have fourth grade teachers Jerry Stagel on the end and Chris Waha, and they are here. So Chris. Everything that we're going to be talking about today is just uh, the technology and how it's functioning in the classroom so far. Um, each of the groups have put together a little presentation for everybody. So we're going to start with um, Jenna and Anna. If you guys would like to step up and introduce yourself. I'm Jenna Seibert. Um, I'm Anna. Getting my own Chromebook has changed my learning. Last year, we only got to use the computers for about 45 minutes, and it didn't matter if we were done with what we were doing or not. And different classes had to come into our room um, when we were learning, and it interrupted our learning, and we had to stop to um, do our computer time. The students have access to information, and we can grab our Chromebooks and look things up on Google if we need information. I've noticed kids that pull out their Chromebooks in the hall and outside to look up things um, that they need to know for homework and stuff. Um, one day for a journal prompt, Mrs. Stagel told us to um, look up different rights and responsibilities from different places around the world. And before we had the Chromebooks, that um, she would have had to give us the information instead of us looking it up ourselves. Learning never stops. We have many different websites to do when we are done with our work, like Cool Math Games, Spelling City, Dreambox, and Typing.com. We call those may do's, and they're the things that we can do after we get our work done. And we call our work a uh, must do's. <laughs> <laughs> um, having our own Chromebook can make learning more exciting. Um, when we got our Chromebooks this year, we were all um, really excited um, about being able to have our own Chromebook. We are always super excited when we have to go grab our Chromebook to learn something new about it. Um, we use a program for math called Dreambox. Um, Dreambox allows me to work at my own pace um, because I'm a little bit ahead of where the class is in math. And when I get my work done early, I can go on Dreambox and um, work on the lessons that um, is a part of math that I'm learning about. I like how Ms. Stage of Science lessons because it is normally about what we're learning in class. So if I don't get what we're learning, um, I log on to Dreambox and do our assigned lessons, and it helps me learn more about it. Because um, when I said that um, I can work at my own pace, um, it's right here. Um, Mrs. Stagel said that our class is about a month or two from learning long division, but on Dreambox, one of my lessons is long division with remainders. This is an assigned lesson. It uh, has like a little box up here, and um, it helps us learn about what we're learning in class. <coughs> uh, 
Hi, my name is Kaya, and I am a student in Mr. Waha's class at Plymouth Elementary, and I am here today to talk about Epic. Epic is an online library for kids like me. Epic lets you read books and at the end of them take a quiz. Epic is better because you can search and find books in a matter of seconds instead of traveling to a local library and finding books by walking around and searching through different books until you find the one you want. Our teacher can also assign us books through Epic. For example, our teacher was teaching us about Malala and he sent us a book about Malala through Epic. After we read the book, we went on Who's Reading and took a quiz. Anyway, I'm going to get to the point now. <laughs> <laughs> I love Epic. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Aaron, and I'm here to talk about Tinker. Tinker is a, pro is a coding and programming website. Tinker uses a step-by-step -step learning process. It starts off by teaching you how to program a person to move and do what the lesson is all about. After the teaching part, they give you a chance to try it out on your own. After you complete more and more lessons, lessons will start to become harder and harder. After you complete a number of lessons, then you can program your own games. If you don't feel like making your own games, you can play other people's games that they created. Tinker makes a lot more simple than pulling out programming kits and sharing them. Although sharing is good, Tinker has made programming fun and, le and lets us work at our own pace. This is Tinker. And so right here is, here's the blocks that you can use to work with. And you can put them up and then when you click the play button, that guy will do whatever you programmed him to do. Um, so as you can see, they have a lot of cool opportunities that possibly weren't there in the past. Um, the girls mentioned 45-minute computer labs, so going to having access at all times based on, from a 45-minute computer lab is huge. Um, and there's just a lot of cool differentiation we can do. You saw with the math, Dreambox, they can you know do reteaching or extensions. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of differentiation with Tinker um, doing computer programming. So thank you guys very much. Uh, Plymouth has definitely um, enjoyed the bond money. We appreciate that. Um, and we'll keep looking forward to more great things. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Does anyone have any questions for the students? We could bring them back up. <laughs> I just comment uh, his excellent job. It, it's wonderful to hear all the the great opportunities you have um, with di the different uh, online learning, the uh, Tinker and, and uh, the Epic and these programs. And when I talk to my son, who's in ninth grade, he is very jealous. He, wish, <laughs> he wishes he would have had those opportunities. But I'm so excited for, um, for you students to be able to uh, take advantage of that. And I'm glad the bond uh, funds are really um, helping your schools. And just to clarify, oh. <laughs> I stopped in at Plymouth on Labor Day weekend, I think it was, so a lot was going on. And I had um, some books to drop off. So it wasn't that I didn't want to be there, more I didn't want to interrupt everything that was going on. But uh, Plymouth is a wonderful place. I was there for 18 years with the, our kids, so uh, it's like home. Any other comments? I would just comment. I actually went to kindergarten and first grade at Plymouth, so oh. when I have walked in there, it looks very, very different. And I wish I could go back because you are having a lot more fun and learning in ways than we did back when I was in fourth grade. So I really want to check out that tinker because I know nothing about programming, so maybe I can <laughs> learn. I don't recall whether it was, was Jenna or Anna that said, learning never stops. Um, and 
they can go to the may do's when they get the must do's done. <laughs> and what a wonderful opportunity to keep that learning going. Um, and what a way to make them want to get the must do's done so they can go on to the may do's. <laughs> really cool, really cool. Nice job of presenting too. Glenn, can I ask what the new technology was when you were in kindergarten? Mm -hmm. I think it was cookies and nap time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to all of you for coming out tonight and taking your evening to come out here and share um, so that we have an insight into how our uh, Chromebooks are being used in the elementary schools. So thank you very much. All right, moving into I have to take my glasses off. 3.3 <laughs> for action, digital radio purchases. So uh, I can take that. All right. Um, for 3.3, we have the digital radio purchases, which is kind of a continuation of one that we had earlier. Um, this is uh, two different uh, sets of radios, if you will. 16 for buses, plus three portables, which kind of work as our base station back in the garage. We have three people there. And, um, if you've ever seen opening day when every bus is trying to talk to one dispatcher, it's a little crazy, so it makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, those are very similar to the same prices uh, that we had the last time. It's on the state bid system. It will bring all our current buses over to digital at that point. The second part is how we said we'd like to expand to our uh, schools, and we want to at least try to uh, test out the system and Central Park was a good place to start because they really come from two schools with a little bit of a cobbled system from what they had there. So we're looking at a base station plus eight portables then that can be shared any fashion that they want to do those um, to do that. It's kind of a pilot, so we get a feel for eight's enough, eight's too much uh, for those things. And as you can see, <coughs> the two different costs, one's 15, uh, the bus radios, $15,556.36. And the buildings, if we were to go with a, um, a, a base station and the eight portables, 6091 The nice thing about the buildings is just like they did with their walkie-talkie systems, if they want to increase that, if we give them a nice base to start with, they do that over time, you know, buy a couple more if that's what they want to do. Um, so far, I can <coughs> tell you from the digital radios we use in the system, the quality of sound is, uh, Unbelievable compared to the analog, and so it's it is crystal clear and, and comes in strong. I wanted to mention a couple other things in the digital radios. We're still looking at uh, something called wave technology, which is more where it's really an app on your phone uh, that gives you that digital phone capability through your phone. It, it's new enough that Motorola certifies all their companies out there, and Anderson is in the process of getting that. We'll get us a couple of test uh, sites when we get rolling. Um, but we really have to see that and analyze um, because there's a monthly cost involved with that, like you might think uh, it's almost like a cell service, but it's not. So we have to find out uh, how well does it work, uh, what's the quality of sound, does it make more sense to do that and uh, not purchase the handhelds, uh, let's say, from the principal, and, and we're going to have to kind of wait and see. They're working on it. We thought we might already have those two already, but again, Motorola is just a little slow rolling out the wave part of it. Uh, but that's there. I uh, did want you to feel too that we will, um, we're waiting for it to be opened, uh, but we will try to put into the Michigan State Police uh, School Safety Grant, um, which people use for a variety of things, but they do use it for communication devices too. Uh, our big push would be our other schools, but it would also be uh, that battery antenna. I think we've discussed mm -hmm. that a couple of times right now. Uh, we've upgraded our antenna, uh, but if we really get, want to get to where we do with more real-time GPS, uh, and not ran in somebody's face all the time, uh, we have to get that. So we hope to do that uh, via the grant. That would be nice. If not, we'll, we'll have us coming back here. Um, we think ultimately we, we've got to get there, so it's just a matter of, of how much we can do in the budget at one time. So, uh, we do recommend approval with the Anderson Radio um, for that amount. All right. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 3.3. .3. I move to approve item 3.3. .3 for the digital radio purchases. Support. All right. Moved by Pam, support by Mary. At this time, is there any discussion? Um, the instant communication that this offers helps keep students safe. 
It's a top priority. It'll help us be better connected, um, more productive, uh, more efficient <coughs> operations. So, uh, so it's a great purchase, a great direction to go. And I, I like the idea of Bluetooth capability as well. It'll be safer all the way around. Right. Any other comments? Bob, what kind of price tag is it going to have to assist roughly if we have to upgrade the antenna to be able to get the full Moto Turbo GPS real-time monitoring of all 40 buses all, all the same time? How much more? The, uh, the antenna is, um, I'd have to, let's see, uh, I'm going to guess it's going to be in the 60 to 65 because we have to spend some money. We don't lose any of that. It's really not a physical antenna that we're buying extra. It's really all the computer switcher gears that go with it. So this first purchase gets you that kind of antenna. We might need another repeater antenna someplace, like back here at our bus garage. So I'd say for the antenna, that 60 to 65 uh, would be the, what's remaining of that. And then each of the buildings, if we were to stay at that level, you're looking at just a little over 6,000 per building. So, um, you know, we would be somewhere around another 60 for that. Um, from what I've seen, what people put in for the grants, not that they always get that, you, you can put in as much as you want, which would be our intent, and, and see what we get uh, geared for. The way the grant works, as far as I can see, is it needs to be spent within that year's time. So you, you wouldn't sit on this. This would be something you would go ahead and say, we're going to spend it, and you would you would get moving on it right away. So my guess is, is someplace out there, unless we find eight's not enough, and it really kind of depends. Some buildings are used to, you know, we get overloaded too, by the way. You can have too many communication devices out there um, within a building. But different buildings have different uh, wants, I guess, as, a, as opposed to, to needs. Um, but if it stayed in that same range, then you'd be looking about 120,000 to completely do that now. Um, there are, if you went the wave and how you did that, it might be a little more, a little less. We haven't uh, been able to get uh, uh, sure pricing on that, but I, I'd say the 120 would might be a good place to just tone us in on as a rough number. Is the Moto Turbo a software package on top of that? No, that should get us everything that we need. The only thing that you're really not getting that like I said, is the wave so new to them, they know there's like a monthly cost, but they can't tell us what that is. They, it's so new, they don't, they don't really, uh, they can't tell me it will work on an iPhone as, as it would on, a, on an Android. Um, so that's the part I couldn't tell you much about because we're waiting for that and it said to give us samples, but um, no, everything should be there. Um, multiple channels <coughs> of communication, multiple paths. Um, I've seen a little bit of what they do. Uh, on the radios. That it's pretty simple. You don't have to even think of channels. It'll say maintenance. It'll say technology. It will say buses. And of course, they have different channels because you wouldn't want that all there. And you do have the ability, too, that if you had a whole, and, and you do need, the buses need to hear each other, too, but if you had a whole bunch of talking at once and wanted to switch them over to another channel, you, you can do that, too. So it's, it's a matter of also not just buying these, but also working with Anderson to make sure we get it set up <coughs> in a way that's convenient, usable, um, and gives us everything we need. So as a clarification, the WAVE technology, um, not only can that be an app for anybody in district, but if you were in a bus and you left district, then... Well, our ho you could if you had that. What we're hoping <coughs> now is we've seen some maps. If we get the, the better antenna, even with what we're upgrading to now, they're looking at a lot more coverage area, even when okay. we're out of the district. Okay. Like quite, and it depends which direction. And they say sometimes it's a little fickle, but it's not unusual uh, if you're heading towards the middle of the state to be able to go quite a ways and still get just through our antenna. Uh, but yeah, you, you could do that. Um, well, we're hoping that with the antenna system, we'll be able to just communicate a long ways with that, with the usual trips. I mean, we're always going to have a trip where if, if you travel to a playoff game and you're, sure. you know, Escanaba, wherever you are, mm -hmm. um, that could be a bit of a problem. But uh, um, I think this should give us a lot more solid coverage, even within the surrounding area where normal league contests would take place. Definitely covers Great Lake Bay, Bay region well to the north as well. Okay. The only <coughs> other comment I had was I saw on the back page, which I just saw it when I was flipping through the packet, on page 34. It said that there's an additional fee for our two new buses, and that's not included in that total. They're not here yet, I don't believe, right, Bob? 
Um, I, I think, as far as I knew, those were included in this one. I didn't read that part. Of, I get where you're at. <coughs> it's a um, tad around page 34, so all I was going to do is uh, volunteer an amendment to add the $280. Yeah, I think it's the 280 I thought the last time I talked to him, that was already in there. If you want to add that amount, that there's no problem. Um, I think after that's talking to him, he, he thought that would be in there. It wasn't going to be a problem. Okay. In fact, I'm not so sure since the buses are in action, we don't already have those on there. But if you want to add that, you certainly could add that to that. <coughs> oh, we need to uh, vote to amend then? Yes, yes. Brad's going to make a motion to amend. Okay. I make a motion to amend to add the additional $280 if that is necessary for the two new buses. If it's not, great. We won't spend it. All right. Do I have support for that motion? Support. All right. Moved by Bat. Brad, supported by Pam. Any discussion on that? I, I just had one question, uh, <laughs> Bob, N not, not related to Brad's issue. As far as writing the grant goes to MSP um, for the educational grant, is it something that we're going to write as a total uh, for 146000 or is it going to be two separate grants looking for the twenty-one? Now to hopefully recover that, or how will that work? You can't re it has to be money that hasn't been spent, so there's no recovery in the grant. Not seeing the grant form, my guess is we would write it for everything remaining that we haven't spent money on. Okay. Um, if I see something different when we see the grant form, they don't leave that online. Um, I can see who won last year and who got what money and, and basically what they were putting in for. But you can't see the form. So, so I would tell you that uh, most likely what we would do is the intent would be to write for all of it, Unless when we pulled up the grant form, we saw something that made sense to separate them and let us prioritize. We'd have to prioritize them. My guess is we prioritize with the antenna to get our, where we need to be and, and us as the general fund go about getting the schools and bringing them on. And what we've seen is that would be in the ballpark of what they normally grant. And so it's not like we're good going after something that hasn't been granted before. Okay. All right. So at this time, all those in favor of the amended amount, 21,647.36 plus the 280, say aye. 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 All those opposed. All right. Now, do we have to go back and vote on the original? Well, the way you worded it, I think you just covered it. We just covered it. Yep. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> Moving into 3.4, for action, purchase of cafeteria tables at Plymouth and Woodcrest. Do you want to yep, give a little um, background on that, Bob? Yeah. The, um, we were not moving pretty fast, and the intent is to turn over the new additions around that Christmas break time. Mm -hmm. um, and the lead time on furniture, as you guys know, seems to be forever. Um, so you have to go ahead and order them. Um, we're still getting the national pricing on all these. This is the, the same uh, types of tables that we got at uh, Sunday Park. There's various reasons to do that. Not that we don't keep people competitive, but we always try to look for some similarities so you can move things around a little bit. There's nothing mm -hmm. worse, and you've seen it sometimes as we close buildings down here. There, there could be five different <coughs> brands of desks out there, and, and none of them fit together, kind of thing. And so uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I have not seen the drawings of it, but they hurried along. When I was talking to FFO at that time, we we just weren't sure we'd get the grant in time. Um, furniture companies apparently have a lot of shows in downtime as soon as the start of school's over. Uh, every furniture person's on a break someplace because they've just got done opening schools across that. So. The first of October was a, was a tough time to get them, but uh, this is set to go. The big difference, you more like you saw it in the, uh, in the bid tab that was there, the two invoices, just the capacity of how many kids need to eat lunch at a certain time. And in these cafeterias, don't forget, uh, the serving lines come out. We don't have a separate serving area. So the design, that's why it's been a little slower, is we're trying to work around where that comes out and how you fit it in. That does mean occasionally not that the price would really change, but uh, it can be in, after they see it up close and personal, they'll say, I can't do a round there. I need a rectangular table. That changes once in a while. But the seating capacity, they pretty much know from, from the numbers. And that's the only difference between them is how many kids do they need to sit during uh, any given lunch. Uh, they both have three lunches. Um, just if you look at total student population, you would count for the difference. All right, at this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 3.4. I'll move to approve item 3.4 as listed on the agenda. Support. Okay, moved by Scott, supported by Mary. Is there any discussion? 
I know, it was at both schools or is it Plymouth? One of them still had the tables that came out of the walls. Yeah, um, <laughs> in Plymouth there are, there are a few tables, but the vast majority of theirs come out of the walls, so of course you can't move those. Mm -hmm. And the condition of the other ones aren't necessarily what we want to move forward with, and the same would be for Woodcrest, the tables are old enough there. And when these tables go, um, as long as all the mechanisms work well, uh, they're not hard to move cafeteria tables. When they get old and the springs get old, uh, they can get much tougher to move around and get them to open and stay open. And um, the ones in the walls we've had a lot of troubles with uh, in the last few years doing that because uh, there's no counterbalance to them anymore. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I have someone there that's really, really pulled them up. So it makes sense to replace all the cafeteria tables at this point. There. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? All right. At this time, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Moving into <coughs> item four, request to address the board. Do we have any requests? All right. At this time, is anyone? All right. Please state your name and address. And <laughs> That's right. Why are you laughing, Brett? <coughs> I agree. Okay. We <laughs> pass the and then you'll start the clock, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kurt Yaki, and I live at uh, 3600 Abbott Drive in town. I'm here this evening to address a uh, contract question. A, uh, I was interested in finding out how it was that class rings are um, handled by the district. <coughs> and for, any, for those of you who went to the fundraising event last year for the Booster Bash, this company that I'm talking about uh, donated rings at that occasion. The question that came up was, uh, is there a contract for class rings in the district? I wrote to Mr. Sharo, we wrote back, and he said, <clears throat> it's on the back of your packet, Midland Public Schools has not entered into contracts with companies who sell class rings. There is not any financial obligation by the district when allowing a vendor access to our students and parents, so no contract is needed. High school principals choose a vendor based upon service and quality of their product. So I contacted the two principals. One got back to me, the other one didn't. And I found out was there really are two different contracts. There's one for caps and gowns and uh, diploma covers. Her, I'm going to correct you and correct your statement on me in here. The, there is no contract. Mm -hmm. And that's what I t told you. There's agreements with the two companies, but no written contract. I, I, it, it does, a contract doesn't have to be written. So there is a contract because something's purchased and money's paid for it. So it's a contract, whether you call it that or not. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Well, it's, so it's not a written thank contract. you for the interruption because it doesn't make any sense. It's obviously a contract because there was money paid for services or for items. There's two of these, there's two of these contracts, one for each high school. They're both for $2,500, even though there's different number of students at each school and it's to purchase caps and gowns, like I said, for those two schools. The only difference is the color. So if you put them together, they should be $5,000, but they're not put together from an accounting standpoint. And I think that that is unusual. If you read this whole packet, you will find the questions that I'm really asking. What I'm trying to get to here is this. If there is one contract for the caps and gowns and they pay 2,500 for it, we have no issue with that. But that's tied to the ability to market and sell rings within the school. And why is that? Mr. Sharo indicates that the reason is that if they give the ability to sell class rings in the building and they attach it to this $2,500 contract, that you actually get that contract for less. I also asked, what's the amount of a contract that has to be bid? And I, he wrote back something in the neighborhood of $12,000. If those two are actually a contract, the value of this is way over $12,000, because even if one of these 
um, ring sellers sells 100 rings. It's $40,000. So putting these two together. It's $5,000, so it's 12000 is well above that. I, you lost me on that. Well, if, when you read the packet, it will be clear. And I may have lost you, but I'm really trying to hurry because um, you get a I'm minute. You know. I'll give you the extra minute I took from you. OK, great. <laughs> OK, so the real issue here is why is there a prohibition for any other ring company to offer rings inside the school? That would mean whatever Johnston's gets, which is the ability to put up a sign. And I don't know whether they come to parent-teacher conference night and they can talk with students and parents about it. But we're prohibited. This company that I'm talking about is prohibited from doing that because Johnston's has this exclusive arrangement for that. Why is that? Why not free enterprise? And I think the reason is there's this sweetheart contract. I later found out it is a secret contract because it's never published. Sometime in February, the principals select some ring companies, at least that's what we say the procedure is, and they send out a request and they supposedly get a request for the opportunity to do all of this. Well, I don't know if it ever happened. One principal never got back to me. The other one never mentioned that there was this procedure that happened in February. So I don't know if that really exists, but assume that it does. I think if you, the district wants to buy caps and gowns from whoever they want, fine. But why is it that only one company is given the opportunity to market and sell rings within the building? So that's the question. And I think if you have a chance to read the whole thing, some of this might make sense, because some of it might not. Any questions for me? Thank you for speaking to us tonight. Thank you. All right, moving into item five. Or is anybody else like to? Of all the people left. <laughs> all right, moving into five, curriculum instruction and assessment. So study committee meeting um, minutes from September 18th. And I have those. Damn. All right, on September 18th at 2.15, uh, the committee met. Brian Bruton, Janet Greif, and Janet Greif presented major initiatives for the 2017-18 school year. Initiatives discussed include the STEM strategic plan, kindergarten through third grade literacy plan, paths program, the Illuminate DNA <coughs> training, achievement gap strategies, final phase of teacher and administrator evaluation integration, foreign language changes, gifted and talented program pilot, middle school innovation, bullying and tolerance programming, and enhanced early childhood services. So you can see it was you, a you did a lot in that full, meeting. Uh, meeting. Um, we also covered the spring 2017 MSTEP data. Initial analysis of this data was presented and revealed that the historical trend of significantly outpacing state averages across grade and content levels continued. The SAT scores revealed district rankings ranging in the top 1 to 3 percent in the state. Continued focus on reducing the achievement gap and increasing proficiency in elementary English language arts will persist. And then uh, we did a little brainstorming on possible topics for future meetings. But it was a very good meeting. All right, thank you very much. Moving into item six, which is FFO. So do you have that one to read too? Excellent. Patrick not being here tonight. We met on um, October 9th. We did. Um, we went over October purchases. Mr. Cooper shared information regarding three purchases, which will be brought to this board meeting and we've discussed. The first purchase was the upgrade of the district radio communication system that we just talked pretty in-depthly about. And then the second purchase is the upgrade of uh, current sign engraver. 
Um, as the district has taken on more of the plastic sign engraving, instead of using outside vendors, the current machine is being purchased um, beyond its original design, or being pushed beyond its original design and capabilities. So two bids were received. One of the two bids was for an alternate brand machine than the one that was requested, which would require different software, additional training, and make current cutters and materials owned by the district unusable. So the administration recommend uh, issuing the purchase order to Able Engravers of um, Illinois for $14,326.99. The third purchase uh, is for the furniture, uh, the cafeteria furniture that we've talked in depth about. We talked about bond work. Mr. Dombrow and uh, Barton Milo uh, reviewed and discussed the committee <coughs> Um, with the committee, the upcoming project bid schedule of Chestnut Hill and Siebert renovations and additions. Mr. Jerome of French and Associates reviewed the site and building plans of the two buildings. Then we moved into uh, discussion of the Jefferson Pool. Mr. Sherrill and Mr. Cooper reviewed the information to be presented at a joint meeting with the Midland Community Center of Middle School Community Pool users. This included the current status of the Jefferson Pool and the costs associated with fixing it. The pool meeting is the initial uh, step to examine pools in, Midland, in the Midland community by all stakeholders and the format of possible next steps and the formation of possible next steps. So again, that was a, a full meeting and a lot discussed and it uh, looks like we're moving toward um, community conversations about that pools in Midland in the future. All right, thank you. Bob, if you would. Before I get to the gifts, if I could, uh, last minute Energy Star Awards came in. I just wanted to show you we had two buildings, Midland High and uh, Chestnut Hill again. So it's real quick, they just came. But uh, in essence, the, the Energy Star program uh, is if you're using approximately 35% uh, less energy and emissions than buildings similar to you. So that's two buildings. It's the second year for Chestnut Hill and Midland High has just gotten there. So. Just wanted to mention that, didn't fit any place right away, but about a month from now, Bill late, we'd like to get them out to the buildings so they can put them up, and you might have seen one if you've been to Chestnut, at least a sticker in the window there. So before I get to the, the information, I thought I'd do that. Tonight, uh, 6.2, we have gifts totaling $15,044.29. Uh, you'll see there that there's a fair amount from the community gift programs for our various uh, athletic teams. A lot of middle high there is Dow team too. Again, remember that's where they do uh, work <coughs> in the community and the Dow Chemical Company then rewards them with $1,000. So our teams have learned to do that. I think it's a good thing, gets money for the program, but also gets them involved in the community uh, doing different things, a uh, wide variety. Um, the Dow High Boosters Club, a uh, lot of support going out there for different things. Uh, you saw the wrestling mats earlier. They didn't quite catch that, but those wrestling match, uh, mats are going to be, is going to be purchased with uh, some boosters got money to go with donations they've already had in there. And then, of course, at the top, we have the Siebert uh, PTO uh, with some supplies for teachers and also a couple thousand dollars, uh, uh, one for Mr. and Mrs. Allen Ott, and then the matching one from the Gerstecker Foundation. So, again, appreciative as we always are on all those things. 6-3, um, you actually have to take action because of the amount of money involved, as you know. I'm going to get to 5000 and more. On a gift, uh, we ask that you approve that. So I need action on 6-3. It's $5,000 for classroom administrative uh, support for the Plymouth PTO, like we've seen other places do. Mm -hmm. Most of our PTOs like to support it. And it goes for various things in the school. Um, sometimes, in this case, it might go for the teacher, but it might also include some field trip money. So it just depends on the building and how they use it. But we'd need action on that one, if I could, please. All right. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 6.3. I move that we approve item 6.3. Support. All right, moved by Scott, support by Lynn. Is there any discussion? It is truly a Plymouth night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> all right, moving into 6.4. And we still have a little bit more for information though. These are gifts of items. It's very typical, so it's not really a dollar amount per se there, but if you bought any musical instruments, uh, you know that, that those are nice gifts. A trombone clarinet and a double French horn, and then actually a donation of headphones to Plymouth um, <laughs> from 
local church. So, um, there's four items there that we appreciate also. Again, um, pretty generous, pretty wide variety of uh, things listed this time around. Mm -hmm. And again, the Plymouth night. <laughs> All right, moving into item seven, which is human resources. So, Mike. We have uh, two members who announced a retirement um, with the effective dates. Shelly Blaine, a paraprofessional at Seabird Elementary, will retire, retire on January 2nd of 18, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lorenz, teacher at Adams Elementary, uh, retired September 30th, 2017. All right, we wish them well in their retirement. My daughter had Betsy, her fifth grade. All right, moving into item eight, correspondence to and from the Board of Education. You can read that in the agenda. Item nine, scheduled activities for information. Um, note that our next regularly scheduled board meeting will be November 20th. Hard to believe that we're almost to the end of the year. And now we'll move into 10, which is study discussion section, hearing from board members. So Brad, I'll start with you tonight. All right. Uh, the wonderful event at uh, Central Park that was great earlier this week. Um, phenomenal job by everybody in attendance, Mr. Liveris, uh, Mr. Whiting, um, on down the list. Everybody was did a great job, and especially A.G. Shooty. Um, also want to thank the board for the gift of the books uh, in honor of my grandmother that recently passed. 99 great years. Um, I also have some numbers for you. 8 and 1, 450, 100, 100, 100, and thousands. Tickets go on sale Wednesday. 8 and 1 records for the two football teams. 450 plus band members <clears throat> combined between the two schools and they'll be on the field together. <clears throat> 100 plus cheer and palms, 100 plus players, 100 plus volunteers and coaches and thousands and thousands of patrons to watch great school spirit on display. And I hope everybody can come out. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Great fall night in Michigan. Yeah. I think the gist of that was arrive early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you, you bet. <laughs> exactly. All right, thanks. Lynn. I'd just like to thank um, Plymouth for coming again tonight. It was really fun to hear the kids and see the programs they're using and it was a good piggyback for our uh, curriculum meeting at Central Park today because we did actually see the EPIC program and a couple <coughs> other of the programs the kiddos were using with he headphones with not so it's just amazing what what opportunities our students have and along that line uh, we received a few letters here from Mrs. Slaybaugh's fifth grade class at Plymouth, of course, <laughs> and they're, they're from um, the students, and they were just, I was going to just comment or read a couple of their comments. One that says, I will use this responsibly on <coughs> this new Chromebook. Uh, another one said, the Chromebooks are a good reading place. And another one thinks typing on the Chromebooks are fast and easy. He likes it a lot better than the iPad. So <laughs> well, good. Um, our students are already comparing iPads <coughs> and Chromebooks they know <laughs> far more than I do. So um, anyway, I, I, to me, that's the most exciting part of, of what I do um, being on the board is, is that impact the kid we're making on the kids and then that feedback from them and their teachers. Um, and kind of along with what Brad said, enjoy the whole week. There's Spirit Week at the high schools. They decorate hallways, and there's all kinds of things going on. So um, it'll be an exciting, exciting night. Thank you. Scott. So I guess on a personal experience with the Chromebooks, you really can't underscore their value enough. They are game changers, as evidenced by um, the kids that were here tonight. But I see it every day with my own children. I have a fourth grader at Seabird, and I have a second grader at Seabird. Um, and they have turned into voracious fact checkers. Um, <laughs> you can't get anything past them because they will whip out the Chromebook, and they will Google it, and they will search it, and they'll find the right answer. Um, so it's great to see them actively learning and actively researching. Uh, and the, the, the programs are phenomenal. The EPIC program is great. The Extra Math, the Dreambox. Um, these are really powerful tools that, like you said, 
we didn't have them. You didn't have them. Certainly, I didn't have them. Um, it's just, you know, where would we be if we had these 20 years ago? And what is it going to allow these kids to really achieve uh, is really fascinating and, and exciting to think about. Um, also exciting was the Energy Star Awards. I love that. <laughs> um, hopefully we will, you know, keep striving to get every building in line with these. Um, it was really important to, to move our buildings into the 21st century and get them energy efficient. And, and the cost savings are tremendous. And we see that trickle down effect um, throughout the district because we get to put that money somewhere else. Um, Kim Wood is a superstar, not just a shining star. I see her <laughs> weekly at Seabird, and she is phenomenal. Uh, she does such a great job seeing her interact with students and other parents. Um, it is really, really a blessing to have her in that building. Um, and congratulations to Barb as well, who gave a moving speech. Um, recognizing everybody that that she's kind of touched along the way it was really nice to see that and to hear that and to feel how much she really appreciated being here um, so that's all i had tonight thank you Pam. um friday listening to uh andrew liver's talk about what was going on at dow and the big challenge that he laid out for us and 400 students coming from both of our high schools to hear about this we.org this um opportunity to really reach out and make a difference locally and globally and to take the challenge. And you can visit we.org and sign up. And by signing up, you're saying you're going to make a difference both locally and globally. And I think it's a great opportunity for our students. I think it's a great opportunity for each one of us to be a part of that. Um, I've signed up and I invite you all to do the same. Uh, the other thing I'd like to remind folks is it is Cultural Awareness Month. So there are a lot of cool cultural awareness activities that are available in Midland. And if you go to the Midland Community F uh, Foundation website, you can click on Cultural Awareness. And they will show you all these great opportunities that uh, I hope to take advantage of a couple of them anyway. So um, a big thank you for all the gifts. Um, <laughs> I noticed at the bottom of that list were a lot of uh, musical instruments, and I know how expensive those are, and, and uh, what a gift that is to our district to have parents that, that give back. And again, just all the, the monetary gifts as well. So great meeting and um, great things moving forward. Thank you. Mary? Um, I really... Uh, appreciated hearing the kids speaking here tonight and the comments that um, that Mrs. Doan had presented from the students and parents about the changes that have gone on in the school. Um, that w that that's just touching and and really means a lot. Um, the gifts, as as Pam said, the amount of gifts gifts that come into our district, um, all kinds of gifts, big and small, and. Uh, a uh, just amazing amount and thank you to all of those people who made that possible. Special thank you to Cindy Young too for all the work at Central Park um, School opening ceremony. I know she put in a lot of time and it all ran very smoothly so thank you. Um, and as long as we're putting in our, our uh, for, what's it, for what it's worth, the Chromebooks. Um, my grandson's only a kindergartner. He can't bring his Chromebook home yet, but he was so excited coming home and he'd go, Grandma, let me show you what I learned today. So he's you know, getting me to go where he went, had gone on the Chromebook and the songs that he learned. And, and he plays teacher, you know, teaching Grandma how to do this stuff. So it, it's, it's, the learning never stops. It's really been uh, an asset to our district. So thank you to all the taxpayers who supported uh, that endeavor. All right, and I, I think I wanna highlight also the Central Park event Friday that uh, most of us attended. It was a wonderful event, a great way to uh, thank all of our private sponsors who once again so given so generously um, to enable a lot of the extras too that we have, the playground there and um, just a lot of the extras that there. Um, a big thank you to Jerry Wasserman who put yeah. the whole um, event together and to Cindy who <laughs> did a lot of work on that. <laughs> But I think it was, it was a wonderful um, event. So the um, benefits of all your planning really came through. It was, it was great, very well organized, and 
great opportunity to show off the school. You know, I've been in there many times. I, well, I mean, I was there when they started tearing it down all the way till it was built. I've been in several tours since it was finished. This was the first time that I was in where it was actually, school was in session and I got to see it in action. And every time I go in there, I'm amazed at, um, I always see new things. So, and then every time I've gone for some of these tours, I'm amazed at the broad spectrum of people from our community that are there and showing support. You know, it's, it's not just parents of people that are, not just parents of current students, but it's the entire community. And it's great to live in a community where there's that much support for education. Um, congratulations to our shining stars and um, I guess the last thing I have the opportunity this Friday, I'm going to be attending a STEM summit um, at Delta College to um, highlight some of the great things going on in our Great Lakes Bay region in support of STEM. And so we, um, as part of that, there's breakout sessions, three different ones, and um, or three different time slots, and you can pick. And uh, Midland Public Schools has one of the events that we can attend and hear about Central Park. All right, Mike, I will turn it over to you. A special day definitely on Friday, <clears throat> and we want to thank you to all our <coughs> community partners and uh -huh. the incredible community we have. Um, I invited a guest um, who was the executive director of our state superintendent association, Chris Wygen, who was there. Tried to get uh, Brian Wentz, our state superintendent, who had a conflict, and Chris went back and said Brian's going to have to come because um, he said next time he meets with legislators, one of the things he knows they're going to always say is um, public schools are doing too much of the same old, same old. And he said, I'm going to say, hey, get in the car, let's drive to Midland after seeing what we, we had accomplished at Central Park. So it was definitely a special day through that. And I think if Cindy had gotten another email from Jerry, we would have had a breakdown. So we, <laughs> we, were, we were pushed to the limits between, uh, um, you know, typical everyday running of the district and getting ready for a board meeting and, um, and, and thrown in there somewhere was um, the national anthem, which has is, is added t definitely to the workload of all of that. So it's been a, a, a bit, very busy few weeks, and um, I'm here to brag a little more on Cindy. I, I'm about ready to force her to go home because she's probably worked 80, 90 hours um, for the last three or four weeks, so it hasn't been just a week. So thank you to Cindy, and we're going to have to get her out of this office for a while soon here. Um, but special day all the way around. I also need to mention that um, we'll have open houses at our other buildings when they're complete. So Plymouth and Woodcrest aren't complete nearly. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, next year sometime we'll, we'll show those two off and then um, the other buildings as we go forward. Much of what we accomplished at Central Park will be captured in there in a certain capacity in each one of those buildings as they go forward with maker spaces and, and, and the, uh, et cetera, other things as we go forward. So I gotta talk about. Oh, this coming week, I think Brad done a nice job of framing. I like a correct on the record. Seven one is an old football coach. Don't okay. jinx him yet. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I thought I had read it was seven but, uh, and one. Um, um, <coughs> it, it, I got them both winning. I, yeah. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good neutral yeah. stance, Brad. <laughs> um, but it is a special night, and I, I've enjoyed that night. Uh, uh, certainly since I've been here, the the two crosstown rivalries kind of special. I played a little bit of that when I was coaching Texas, but it was two town rivalry in the same district and, and it being the same town. Special night, and I do not want that to be forgotten about with everything going on to, uh, during that night. We need to celebrate so many children's success out there and the time they put in and committing to, to those type of things going forward and our coaches and our bands, you know, all the people that put all the efforts in that night. And so with that, um, Jeff Jester's done a wonderful job of talking with our students and working through um, what a, a national crisis we're having right now. And so it, it, it is popped here. And um, my understanding is tonight that our students and some parents were meeting on a possible uh, solution to this as we've um, asked, encouraged um, to not lose their message of um, trying to point out racial inequality. But, but I think they lose a little bit when they tie it to the emotional issue of our national anthem. And so we'll see where that heads. We'll keep you up to date. And I hope Friday's a very good night, as I wrote today. And um, hopefully today's message was a little more clarity, because evidently everyone didn't read the first memo the way I read it, which was also um, approved by our attorneys on the, on the stance that we have. And many took it also as my personal uh, message. And it, it, I think because it says superintendent communicate, but I am only the spokesman for, for the district, which has, in the district's defense, our district policies have to reflect state and federal policies as well. 
And so hopefully there's a little bit of clarity out there. We all calm down with this national debate, treat each other appropriately, no matter what occurs on Friday night. Um, Friday, I mentioned uh, another great partnership starting um, with the Dow Chemical granting of $30,000 and um, want it requesting a little bit of a match from us to do a study of Central Park and the effects that it may have on the students there long term and the community around it. And so Brian has um, met with the Saginaw Valley State University professors assisting on this. And I think it's going to get some incredible data, which will also help us with the foundations, but certainly if we really do accomplish what we want there, that data will reflect that. And I don't think it's uh, the kind of research we could have done internally. So uh, mm -hmm. it, we're going to get some incredible uh, time research out of the Saginaw Valley group. So lots to come there. Uh, long term study, five years. So it, it'll be significantly long term, but we'll keep you up to date as we go. Uh, last Monday, Bob and I um, met with the community users group on Jefferson Pool. Um, we presented our, our consultants report to them. Uh, we had our community partner in pools, um, the community center there as well. And the consensus of the group was probably not wise to invest nearly $700,000 into a pool of that age, a non-competition pool. Um, and when, as a consultant says, when you get done, you've got a very old house around it still with potential HVAC issues and roofing issues and old locker rooms issues and where, you're, where we're going to go. And so, um, but we didn't really know where to head so that as we talked about um, several years ago they had a study of pool uses in uh, the community the need how much use what's the best going um, the community center is going to look into that for us and take the lead about maybe having a study start that discussion you know we have this many pools in town here's the age of them here's the amount of use there is and, and what, what might our, be best serve our community on pool usage going forward so I think that's a good first step um, maybe it's a little slower than some would want, but I think it's a good first step when we're talking about a long-term solution in pools. Transportation study, um, I, I think we have talked to you multiple times about this and wanting some, um, we don't have any major issues, but I think sometimes we could be better at some things with, that we do and without having others, maybe some outside eyes, take a look at that. Um, Bob and Mike Mogenberg have met some um, transportation study. They do this um, in Michigan pretty regularly, um, study transportation departments for them. They give you a whole smorgasbord of things they'll do. Of course, it's a menu and it's a price. And so we're presently taking a look at wh what we think are the top things we want to look at first, from efficiency of the organization to um, you know, internal controls to safety to all the things that go on. So it, think about it, transportation is a large budget item for us and it's obviously one of your most uh, glaring areas, areas where you, you have safety. And so um, we're going to get a little bit of a, we're going to enter into that, some kind of agreement. We'll bring that through FFO once we know what we want to do, get the FFO, bring it to the board, and move forward. It, it, it'll probably be below any dollar amount we need your approval, but we're going to keep you guys up to date on that and get some data and information and see if we can even get better at um, transportation going forward. Um, this year, I've continued my lunch meetings with staff. I'm about four or five schools in this fall. I'll do it again next spring. It's been a, um, it was a year ago summer idea that I had about getting out in front of the staff more and getting to know them, them getting to know me, and then um, all kinds of good feedback always mm -hmm. from the other side that you need to have, right? You, what you think versus what they think and all those pieces of it. And so I've really enjoyed them. I think um, the majority of the staff has, I think. And it's been a very good uh, thing, and I'll continue to do that piece of it. So we've gone forward. We even bribed them to get down there. We're buying them cookies. So. <laughs> um, MASA um, uh, teacher shortage work group. So I've been asked to join that group. And so our superintendent association is trying to be proactive with our teacher shortage um, issues in our state. Um, we already are beginning to see that here in Midland Public, and if we're he seeing it, you know other districts are. There will be a representation of small districts, large districts, wealthy districts, poor districts on there who all see different issues with the shortage. We've got to get creative. We've got to get creative on how we pay teachers. We've got to get creative on how we drop them in, into the um, services. Our universities are willing partners to have that discussion as well. Um, I also sit on Saginaw Valley State Department of Education Advisory Committee, and so um, they've been very progressive as well, trying to look at this problem. Craig Douglas is a former K-12 superintendent that I happen to know, have known for many, many years, and Craig, being that connected to K-12, understands this issue, and so there, this has been a major issue as Janet's been trying to hire a position right now. She's having some trouble to do, right? So you can see it really coming. 
Student count day, as you know, we, we do a count in October, we do one in February. It doesn't get certified until sometime in November. I'm always cautious. Um, um, I, I think one time I used a number and it kind of backfired on me, on me a little bit, so I no longer do that. And so I'm still going to be cautious for you, but it's still looking very optimistic that it's uh, well above our budget number. And I think it's also an affirmation of the number of parents and students who are choosing Midland Public Schools. I can show you that data pretty clearly to back that up. Um, the Me to We movement that everyone spoke about, I think that's pretty powerful, but we had a lot of work to do on that, and so that moved very quickly as Dow, Dow moves quickly, and we want to be part of it, and so that's why we were the first school that they announced it with, but they plan on moving through all the Great Lake Bay region schools as well, um, and so there's a lot of curriculum side of it that needs to work, and so Brian and the curriculum staff will be meeting with um, probably the We folks as well as Dow at the table to figure out how this fits in exactly into our curriculum going forward. Great start and readiness. You know, our goal is to get that up and running in November, and I was kind of alluding to some hire, hiring issues there. So Janet's been on the, on the interview uh, status to get that, that uh, quality teacher in there, and um, we still are, are trying to track students. So coming mid-year has been a bit, bit of a problem. Remember, we got late notice so that we got the seats, but we need to use the seats because if you don't use them, you'll lose them the next year. And so we really need some help recruiting those four-year-olds for your preschool here. Let's take advantage of the high-quality teacher and that all fits into our potentially exploring into Carpenter. Um, so with Carpenter being in the topic, um, Michigan State University has contacted Brian and said they're ready to purchase the practice robotics area in there and install soon. So that'll be going in there and then um, we are having our architect on the side because they've got so much work for us. Help us with what is it on the lower elementary side we need to do to bring that up into a reasonable preschool area as we go forward. So lots going on, on the, in the district. Um, community presentations, um, I love going out and doing those and educating people about our business because it's not, you know, they don't always know. And so the real estate board asked me to come in. I really enjoyed that one because I, I've always been kind of in tune to many, many years ago as an administrative project, I was given how do we communicate with our real estate agents better about what schools do so they can sell our homes. And so it, it was a great, good discussion. Cindy and I went over and, um, and presented to them, and it was, it was a really good discussion. I think they enjoyed it. And then, of course, you've probably heard the one we did at the chamber. It was a brief fly-through. It was about seven minutes. I'd like to have more time <laughs> uh, to do that. But um, I think it's a start with the business community hearing as well about the schools. And that is it for me today. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we will end the meeting. It's 8.17. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight.